So I've changed the title briefly here because um, I'm not trying to cheat anyone. I will talk about cross-platform development with ChatGPT, but for various reasons I haven't got quite as far with that as I'd hoped by now. Uh, this picture here is, of course, a friendly robot um, generated on mid-journey. How many mid-journey users do we have in the house? One, two. Saves, saves paying someone for a picture, doesn't it? So uh, I'm going to talk about cross-platform development. I'm going to talk about some of my own uses of ChatGPT. And probably many of you have similar experiences, but uh, let's see. Does anyone here? Oh, uh, let's see. This is because I'm a very shrinking, uh, shrinking, introverted sort of person. So I put the about part where I introduce myself quite small. Um, I actually started my career in AI, strangely enough. Uh, I did a degree in experimental psychology, but uh, it was at a university where we were one of the first in the country where we had access to doing AI programming. And it was something called GoFi, we call it now, good old fashioned AI, because it failed. Uh, in the late 1980s, um, we had something called the AI winter, or probably the first AI winter, but there might be another one. Um, because the uh, sort of ways in which we were doing AI in those days, generally referred to as symbolic artificial intelligence, had some, had some problems in terms of scaling it and making it really useful. And um, that's where I sort of had the genesis of being in that sort of area. And then later in my career, I got into like proper work. You know. <laughs> I joined a database consultancy and I did, no. but even then I didn't do proper work. I was the object oriented evangelist. You know. um, so that's how, I, that's how I started. I didn't really like object orientation, but that was the job going. What I really liked was something called logic programming. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of that. So, um, but anyway, that was, that was where I was. And I haven't really touched AI for, for many years. And then of course it's come into our lives as a technology that's usable now. In some way, at least. So, I'm going to start with a little bit of discussion of the technology, just very, very briefly, incredibly high level overview for people who don't know about it. Um, and there's been what really can be described as a discovery. Is that GPT-4, or rather, the large, what are called large lang language models, have arrived uh, in a, quite a surprising way. That is, um, they've, they've sort of come about and had an impact rather quickly after a long time of sort of not very much happening. And the thing about systems like this is that they're based on a very simple idea. Uh, I don't know if anyone, it's not really an English thing, but I don't know if you know this, uh, Dr. Dr. Seuss. I like being exactly. Yeah, you know, yeah. so yeah. And the thing is, you can, when you read that, you know what the next word is. And really, Large language models are really about predicting the next word in a sequence of words. It's just one thing after another. So it's like, you know, there's an element which it's like predictive text on your phone that never works. Except this works. And the reason it works is because they fed it 100 million books and a large part of the internet train it. Now, I, I'm fascinated by this because of my background in psychology and... Uh, these are a selection of, of, of primate brains um, that I found earlier today from the uh, three-dimensional digital brain reconstruction from the brain catalogue. Yeah, so <laughs> you know, forget, uh, forget the sort of catalogue you can order things from. This is a really good catalogue, this one. So um, you have the human here, obviously, with a giant brain here. And surprisingly, the bonobo, I don't know if you notice anything about these brains, apart from the size. Uh, one feature of them is is they get wrinklier. They get more walnut-like the, the further up you go. So uh, somewhere, you know, from the heights of the human, somewhere down to, to the sort of the monkeys that you generate NFTs, uh, somewhere down there. <laughs> so more about that in a minute, actually, because I'm working with NFTs. So that's, I'm sort of putting myself down. Self-deprecation is, is a good strategy, I think. So, I think. Um, But anyway, the interesting thing is the wrinkles, because... Really what's happening, what's really interesting about the architecture of the brain is they all have pretty much the same architecture by now, uh, except this one's got more wrinkles. It's got a lot more of the structure called the neocortex. But a lot of the other parts inside the brain are pretty much the same. And one of the interesting things about the neocortex is it has a very regular architecture. It's not a simple architecture, but it's, it's, a mod, it's modular and repeats itself 
really like uh, a fabric that's really like a fabric, a bit like, well, a bit like a big computer network with many parallel parts that have similar modular capabilities. And that makes you, you wonder because if what makes us different from bonobos is just having a lot more of something, then how does that come, uh, account for this fact that we go from not really being able to talk, not being able to communicate in symbolic ways, to suddenly being able to talk symbolically, use language as this powerful symbolic tool, and so it, it sort of raises some interesting questions. Perhaps, I've often thought, and other psychologists have thought, perhaps there's nothing really clever there. Perhaps we've just got a bit more and there's some kind of trick. Maybe there's some sort of evolutionary trick going on. And some of what happens in language models makes us think that might be the case, actually. You know. um, it took three billion odd years to evolve the, uh, the neuron in various forms. And they're quite complicated little things. You know, they've got lots of, some of these have thousands and thousands of little protuberances from them that talk, touch other, other neurons. And there's a, the neural network in the brain is incredibly rich and complex. The neurons we have in our AI systems are really simple. And they're based on an idea from 1943. And essentially, they haven't really changed very much in that time. These things, each one of these neurons, takes some value as an input. And it puts an output out. And it calculates a function of those inputs to give you an output. And that's it. So these things are connected in a very rich way. And they are also quite different. There are sorts of uh, uh, whole societies of different looking sorts of neurons with different kinds of um, uh, different kinds of uh, length, sizes, number of connections, and they're all doing something obviously valuable in evolutionary terms. So what these things are doing that we're using today, it, in, a, in a simplistic way, we have a set of words like, like green legs and we want to predict the next word to be ham. Every word in this vocabulary, we call them tokens is represented as some kind of number. They're just arbitrary numbers. And if we had some functions here that could compute these numbers and generate that number that represents the next word, it will output that word. And that's essentially, you know, the hard piece here was actually working out how to train these to get these functions correct. They're all very standard functions. They take different values and they have to be trained. So that was the big, that was the big sort of um, about 15, 20 years ago, probably 20, 20, probably late 80s, uh, early 90s, they discovered how to train these networks. That, that was the first big breakthrough, really. Um, the reality of a system like chat GP, large, large language model is there's a lot more to it. Uh, uh, so there's a lot more modules and pieces in there. But essentially underneath it, that's what it's doing. It's predicting the next word. And that's actually quite useful to know about because it does affect how you can use it in programming and so forth. About, I think it was about five years ago, at Google Brain Project, uh, they discovered something which uh, has really caused the language models to, uh, to, be, um, to come about and to be successful. And that, uh, a couple of papers from Google sort of started this all, and uh, we're still really uh, uh, processing the results of those things. Uh, the essence of what that does is it, it uses some real heuristic tricks to build context into the way in which that prediction happens. So instead of just seeing it word by word, there's something about the structure of groups of tokens, as they're called. Tokens might be words, or they might be two word phrases or something. Um, they can use that to more effectively uh, 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 do the job it does in terms of generating outputs. So it's something. Um, that we see a lot of, there are a lot of ways to, to do things with code. Uh, I call it better bricklaying because I think a lot of code work tends to be at the level of bricklaying. It tends to be, um, you know, an architect designs great big buildings and then designers and um, uh, companies like Ove Arup and who are in the engineering side, kind of architectural engineers, will kind of build these things. And at some point, some bloke sticks a brick on top of another one and puts some mortar on it, and that's bricklaying. A lot of programming is like that today. And uh, there's lots of hype about this. I mean, you know, a lot of people are worried about losing their... I mean, 
or shall I start a career even in this sort of area? People are, people are wondering because of this stuff. And um, most probably, th they'd be safe to have careers in this area still. Um, this isn't going to necessarily uh, take over all the programming in instantly, but it's a, it's a question really to know where, how far we'll go, we can talk about. So I just thought I'd describe some of the things I've tried and, and then talk a little bit about the, the porting uh, mobile. So these are some of the things that I've actually, I'm trying to categorize some of the things I've been using it for. And straight code generation is the one that's exciting everyone on Twitter, and, you know, who wants to generate a miniature version of Tetris in Python or something. Um, but uh, you can use it to do more interesting things than that. It's, it's, it's pretty good. In particular, ChatGPT, um, what they did at OpenAI is they, they took this basic underlying model of language. Uh, the version that we're using now is called GPT-4, and there are other versions you can use. The, the free version, if you go on their system at the moment, set up an account, is GPT-3.5. Um, 4 is a more, more recent one. Um, but those, um, those basic language models are not really easy to use. You can get hold of some small ones and run them on your laptop. So they are available. Uh, I think um, Llama is, is one that I think you can get and run yourself. <coughs> And if you play with those, you get an understanding of the technology uh, that, that could be quite valuable. Well, they can't do the marvellous things that uh, ChatGPT does with GPT-4. So when you're on ChatGPT, you can select GPT-3.5, which is very fast, but not as good. Or GPT-4, you have to pay for 20 bucks a month to access it. Um, and sometimes you can't get on because it's so popular. Um, and when you get on that one, um, if you type something into ChatGPT with 3.5 and you say, give me some code, it'll kind of spit it out instantly. It's kind of blah, and it's there, and it's quite exciting. If you do ChatGPT4, it comes out, it's like getting blood out of stone sometimes. It leaks out a word at a time. It kind of prints it slowly. And um, because it's doing a lot more. There's a lot more stuff <coughs> going, on, going on there. Um, I can't, I'm not absolutely sure the exact number, but it had something like... Um, uh, 100 and, 120 odd billion parameters that have been trained. So it's training a hell of a lot of these things. Uh, as the, those, that little set of inputs is a really big set of inputs uh, in these language models. Um, so there's a lot going on there. Now what they did though was um, the thing that made the breakthrough for them in terms of usability in the public was take that base model and then train it with human interaction. So the chat part is reflecting the fact they trained this using a technique called reinforcement learning where people asked questions of the model, it gave them several answers and then said, I like that one better than that one. And through this process of iterative uh, uh, reinforcement training with users actually telling them what it was that they liked to hear, it built up this capability to do dialogue really well. So it does this really remarkable thing for AI systems which is you can keep talking to it. If you give it some, in, you can say generate some code and it'll make some mistakes, but the cl really clever thing is you can go back and say you made a mistake and it will fix it, uh, or it will try and fix it sometimes. Um, and that's what I call generation via dialogue. You don't just ask it to generate code, you actually un undergo a, a process with it where you ask it to do things and it gets better. As you discuss things, as you go through this dialogue, and provide more information, you provide with more and more context. But it's still using all of that context just to generate some next words, some next tokens. So mm -hmm. it's pretty good at that. Um, one of the surprising, you know, one of the things it can do really well is translation. So you give it, particularly with computer language, it's pretty good. I sort of assume it had access to something like the repository, of GitHub repository that Microsoft bought because Microsoft have paid for the, um, for a lot of the, they put a lot of the money in that OpenAI used to build this, this model. It cost many, many millions of dollars to build ChatGPT4. Um, so it's got a huge repository somewhere that was trained on of code. And as a result, formal languages, the nice thing about computer languages is they're quite regular. They've got simple syntax compared to natural languages. So it's pretty good at figuring out what comes next. That's what it does in terms of syntax. And so it can do translation pretty well. Actually, it's surprising me when we look at a couple of examples. I have been quite surprised by some of the things that it's done. 
Um, and there's um, a well-known uh, sort of phenomenon in AI. Back in the 1980s, or I think it might be 19, actually, sorry, it was 1970s, um, a guy called Weizenbaum built a program called Eliza. And uh, it's a very early AI program, it was very simple, and it was really doing text templates. You would say something to this thing, it would look at the structure of your sentence and try and find a, a pattern that matched it. It would take a word out of what you said and then it would feed it back to you. And the idea was to create a kind of uh, computerized psychologist or psychiat psychiatrist or therapist. And it was very, very simplistic. And Weizenbaum did it almost as to show that this was kind of a stupid idea, but was surprised that people were pouring their hearts out to it, even though it was really simple. So people have got this tendency to see intelligence in things, want to see intelligence in things that isn't really there. Even something simple like Eliza. And in a way, ChatGPT is like a super duper Eliza. It's a, um, it's a very much advanced version of that. So one of the things I've, I've, I've been doing is uh, learning stuff that I don't know, learning a bit of Android programming, uh, learning some other concepts I want to learn. And one of the interesting things I think here is you can learn just the things you need to learn at the time you need to know them. Just in time knowledge acquisition for you. So I might, uh, you know, because I'm a programmer and I've done a little bit of Android in the past, and I know iOS programming and Swift, <coughs> the language in Android Kotlin is superficially very similar to Swift. So the syntax, uh, you know, I'm a curly bracket language man, so I can read curly brackety things really easy. If they're C, C++, you know, Swift, Kotlin, they all look a bit similar to me, so I'm fine, even sometimes JavaScript. Yeah. But, um, uh, so, you know, you can read them, sort of parse them visually, you've got a kind of idea of how it's all patterned on there. Um, so the great thing about this is that you can use the basis of what you know, start doing something and say, well, there's a bit, I don't know how this is, ask it, how do I do that? And you incrementally learn just that one thing you know now, you want to know now, so it's just in time learning. We can see there's dangers to that, because we might start thinking we're, we're cleverer than we are because we start to learn, oh, I can do anything now. I can start to program in Ada or something. You know, so there are some dangers here and it might create some sort of hubris. Um, so generation by dialogue, incremental, incrementally elaborating things. Uh, it seems to work better sometimes if you incrementally build things up through a dialogue. Um, quite good for finding some, some bugs. Um, compiler errors that are incomprehensible happen frequently with uh, Swift UI programming on iOS uh, and other things and sometimes it will give you a really, good, a really good explanation of what the error is that you wouldn't have imagined. Often though it's, it's no better than you could have done anyway, but often it's good. Um, and something I've been using it for is exploring poorly documented APIs. There's a lot of code there. I'm working at the moment with the Snapchat camera API augmented uh, reality <laughs> framework and it's, it's never quite come out of beta as far as I can see. Uh, and it's, um, they're doing work on it all the time, but it's, it's kind of arcane. It's, there are very few tutorials or any information, so you have to dive into the, the guts if you want to do anything uh, custom. Um, some other things that's really been amazed, sample jet data generation, because very good at generating really realistic looking sample data. So one more moment while my, my egg was put on to, to be cooked, um, I took some, this is a geeky language here for everybody, but um, it's, uh, I took some, uh, a little bit of um, deserialization code in iOS and that takes JSON. I gave it a bit of JSON and I said, generate me some uh, classes, some codables to, to, to pass this. <clears throat> I spat them out. I changed it. I said, okay, I made this change to it. Now generate me a JSON schema to describe my data. I got a couple of classes. It generated a JSON schema. And I said, here's the JSON schema, generate me some sample data, and it generated me some very realistic looking sample data. And did that before my egg was cooked. So, you know, the, this is sort of the sort of thing that you, you kind of do when you're doing boring plumbing uh, in building software APIs that have to talk to remote services. Uh, and this makes it, a lot of that plumbing go away, or a lot quicker anyway. Um, I have tried test case generation, some that can be successful, but you have to know what you're, you do have to know how to drive it. Uh, it won't necessarily find all the cases you need. You know, so you have to be knowledgeable about how you want to generate some test cases. So these are some things I've done with it, and probably by the end you'll have thought of things that you can do with it that are slightly different. 
my timekeeping might not be great here. I, the point is this, I've got 24 minutes left, but that cannot be right. <laughs> that cannot be right. I'm sure I've had quite a lot of time already. How am I doing? I think you've had about 15 or 20 minutes. 15 minutes, oh, okay, cool. One thing that occurred to me, because I was thinking about this uh, business of how it um, predicts the next token, I was diving around in the, I was trying to understand the Snapchat API um, because I'm trying to work out how to build a custom component to work with it. And it's very unclear whether or not I can use some of those components that are in there, or whether I have to build my own, or whether I can subclass them, or whatever. So I started trying to poke around, and I eventually found that quite a lot of things were internal. Um, but I wanted to know what, what was a little bit about what was in there. So I thought, well, I wonder if you can obfuscate the internal classes. I just deobfuscate it because I played around with obfuscation, deobfuscation in the past, and it just quite. I thought this was quite impressive, although you know it has its problems here. But basically what I did is I put a piece of this code in, which is obfuscated, um, which you'll be very familiar with, and it just has one or two things in there that you can hang on to as a human. Uh, you can see mime, uh, which either means that, or it means something to do with data, uh, video data or something. And we can see media format, so we've got a good idea that it's something to do with media and formatting. And it, uh, given this uh, query, although I probably spelt it wrongly there, um, it generated mappings by simply matching what it thought it had out in its code base with that. And I don't know how correct this is. It's probably completely wrong. It's probably not to do this. It's probably to launch a nuclear weapon or something. <laughs> but, uh, you know, anyway, it came up with this stuff. And um, it gave me some idea, at least, it gave me some idea what was going on in that code base, even if I wouldn't trust myself to try and compile and run that code. That it it uh, de 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 But I thought it was quite interesting. So, what, the reason why I first talk, thought of this talk um, was that I, I, I'm currently um, working on a project where I've built a little iOS app, uh, to, uh, which is a, it's actually a um, commercial application to explore, uh, a, joke, a joke to say, uh, to, to, to explore uh, um, uh, the possibility of selling people digital fashion. So it's for digital fashion, it's uh, from a company in the Netherlands, it's absolutely amazing company with really extraordinary design concepts and things. Um, you know, fashion is another strange world, uh, you know, not really my world, but it's really fun. And I've um, been building this little app for them so that people can put on digital fashion and try it out and then send videos. So it's social augmented reality videos, Snapchat filters, basically, with this jewellery or fashion or clothing or whatever that they're, they're, they're designing. And it's got a kind of an element of it, this company's got a kind of element where uh, there are tools that allow people to design the fashion. So there are people who, you know, who out there would be fashion designers, it's a creative, the creative economy as we call it. And um, through these, their systems they can then uh, uh, show this fashion, um, <coughs> sell it as NFTs on a very low carbon blockchain I should point out, um, and then allow people to have some fun with it, actually wear it and share it. So that, that's what I've been working on. And um, this is sort of an example of some of the, the uh, stuff they're coming up with. So I had um, to build an iOS app with the Snapchat camera kit. It's not really well documented. It's all built using um, some of the generation back. Because uh, it's, you know, it's, for this kind of thing, you can't really use these declarative frameworks like Swift UI and Jetpack. You need to get your hands a bit dirtier. Um, and it's a really simple augmented reality app. Snapchat handles the camera and the augmented reality functionality. And uh, well, you know, my job is to make sure that's integrated with the various catalog of fashion that they want to give to people and so forth. Um, so we have a blockchain integration that stores the fashion that people own, their collectibles. And I have a little, we have a little uh, content management system that pulls in a catalog of all the stuff that's available and puts it online. Um, and this is built in Swift UI, but Snapchat's <coughs> all UI kit, and so it involves digging into that to get to do some customization. And ha having done that, I, I thought, well, I wonder if I could do the, the Android version of this, because it's quite a, a simple starting point. So um, I've started, but it just so happened that uh, it's taken a bit, a, a, a bit longer than I expected for the iOS app to settle down in terms of specification. And I think it worked, for me, I wanted to have the whole thing pretty much nailed down before I started trying to transform code, because I thought, well, 
will it just be a one-way process? If I generate code, what happens if the code gets changed? Do I need to now generate it back? This round-tripping problem is often a problem with automated tools in software. Very often, if they don't round-trip very well, that kind of makes the whole process really troublesome. So I wanted to wait until I could um, be sure that I wouldn't need to do a lot of that. Um, so I spent, while I waited for the design to be formalized, I sort of spent a few days getting into the APIs on Android, uh, did a bit of a demo layout in Jetpack, um, and uh, building it, and then started to port the UI components. Less a bit, there's not a great deal of business logic, it's mostly navigating around the app. Um, so really the business logic tends to be around just getting the right data into the right places, so there's not a lot of it. What I was surprised though is that this round trip, <coughs> it was a lot better at, I was a lot more able to do this than I expected. So these are very simple structures, so these are just, these are basically just, um, uh, you know, just some data structures. But I found it very straightforward to make changes in one platform and get ChatGPT to incorporate those changes, even ask it to merge the differences. It can do some of these for you. It'll say, well, I'll take the bit that, I'm not, that you've, you've got right and I'll put some additional pieces in. And did that pretty well, actually. And so that saves that, that, that ability to do a certain amount of round tripping uh, certainly makes it more useful than, than it could have been otherwise. So some of the challenges you might have experienced or heard of with chat GPT, one of them is it's a API hallucinations. Um, it will come and tell you, you know, uh, it'll say, ah, the way to do that is to use the opacity modifier in Android. And then you put it in the, into the Android Studio and there's no opacity modifier. And uh, it happens with, with all the time because um, it actually does this thing um, which I call confabulating. If it doesn't know the answer to something, it makes it up. In fact, humans have the same problem. Um, uh, people who suffer from a condition um, uh, where it was originally uh, ob observed in people who uh, were bad alcoholics who injured themselves and damaged their brain. Um, they damaged their sort of hipp hippocampal regions and um, they lost their ability to remember anything. So they lost their ability to learn new memories, get the memories from short-term memory to long-term memory. So anything new that happened just never gets encoded into long-term memory and they forget it. But then if you ask them about what they're doing or what they did yesterday, they'll make up some incredible story. Um, they'll confabulate something that didn't happen. And um, actually, if you ask them five minutes later, they'll have forgotten they told you that, they'll tell you a totally different story. <coughs> so in a way, chat GPT works a bit like that. It'll, it makes stuff up if, uh, if you aren't very careful. Um, it lacks, uh, the other problem is it lacks knowledge of recent APIs because its model was built uh, on the 21st of September 2021 or whatever. So it doesn't know about a lot of things. And for the purpose that I have, which is taking from one framework and just porting code, um, there in, there, there's a lot in the, in the frameworks between those two uh, that, that isn't, isn't common enough that it can handle it. I mean, something like um, th there are different uh, patterns used in both frameworks. There are different underlying mechanisms for things like uh, asynchronous processing and so forth. So it's not a straightforward mapping. So for that reason, we're not at a point yet where we can generate a whole application this way. Um, it works best, in any case, on small nuggets that it can process. It works best on short elements of code because it's limited in the amount of context you have access to, limited in the amount of, short, if you like, its short-term memory. Um, every time you start a, a dialogue with it, it's as though you started from scratch. Uh, anything you put into that dialogue, it will remember and use as a context for further responses into that discussion. But if you then start a new discussion, it doesn't know any of that. So while they may be logging all that data that you put in to use in future on a training another model, it's not available. It doesn't automatically learn anything. It's what we got, it's called a feed-forward network. It only pushes information through in one direction. It can't look at information and learn from it at the moment. So there's some challenges, but they're not really too problematic because um, if it hallucinates, we have compilers. Um, they immediately tell us the code doesn't work. So it's really great for code because it catches these problems. Many of these problems have been caught straight away. Whereas if you ask it to tell you something about uh, you know, politics or something and it comes out with a load of completely made up stuff, 
Um, there's no way of testing that, and the conspiracy theorist types can have a field day with it. Um, the lack of recent knowledge of APIs, you know, I discovered it doesn't know about how to make a blurred background in Android today, so it doesn't think there's an API for it, and there was uh, introduced after it was trained. That's just a small matter of programming. We'll have to get there and actually code it. So nothing to worry about there. Um, these incompatibilities, the differences between the frameworks, uh, mean that if we want to do code porting, we've got still, it's a job. It's, it's going to be greatly speeded up by this, but it's certainly not, automate, not fully automated in any way. Um, so, and I said organization here because the, way you organ, the better your code is organized, the more modular, the smaller, the better decoupled it is, the better this is going to be able to, to convert it to something else. So I, when, when I start, started thinking about this idea of cross-platform, could this sort of just get away from the need to have any cross-platform tools? Well, ultimately, maybe. Um, but at the moment, um, you know, it's a very different process to use this to do porting between different versions, or even if you had two parallel teams where they're throwing code to each other and converting it, it might not be really practical in business context. And perhaps using these tools like React Native would remain more uh, pro you know, tractable as a tool for the, for the current period, for the, at the moment. However, we may be heading towards the end of GUIs as the predominant way in which we interact with software. Because ultimately, um, ultimately um, if you can talk to a computer and ask it to solve a problem, if as ChatGPT can do, or GPT-4, its underlying model can do, can generate fragments of code to solve problems. Um, and we see millions of things like this on, on, on Twitter and whatnot. They're, it's where the hype is at the moment. People doing very trivial problems, coming up with little bits of code, um, and getting very excited about it, taking everyone's jobs. It isn't there yet. But I thought this was interesting. This is quite hot off the press, because ChatGPT was not just trained with millions of pages of the internet and millions of books. It was also trained with images. It's what's known as a multimodal model. That means it can take images and relate them to the text it's learned, the words it's learned. And it can do things like segment. It can, if you give it a photograph of the contents of your fridge, it can tell you what you can cook with it. It'll give you all the recipes you can make, you know, and so forth. So there's all sorts of tasks you can do with it that are really quite interesting. And so the software people, first thing we wondered was, well, could you give it a napkin sketch of something, some GUI and generate it? Um, it's a bit of a, it's a toy example. But this has only just become available through some kind of, I haven't tried it out, it's called Mini GPT, but it allows you to use text input, and uh, graphical input as well as text. And, and this is just a, a, simple, it's a terrible joke for a start. I mean, they don't understand humor, these AIs at all. Uh, but that's just that's what we'd expect from data, wouldn't it, in, the, in Star Trek and the next generation. Nothing too surprising there. But this raises a question. Um, if you can use ChatGPT as you can today, uh, some people are experimenting with, to effectively translate between human language and, let's say, commands to an API. So we have all these APIs out there. Um, and the human being can say, well, I want to sort of, yeah, I'm, they're not going to pay their, pay for their credit card bill this way. It's not going to be secure. But they're going to do something else that, you know, that involves just talking to an API. Tell me all my, you know, all my Twitter followers, or whatever it might be. Then perhaps the system could generate the code required to talk to that API. Um, and perhaps the same system could generate a GUI on the fly if you'd enter the data if you needed it. Mass, you know, if you're entering a lot of data, then perhaps talking to the computer is not as, um, you know, or typing to it uh, in dialogue isn't as effective as filling in a form, perhaps. But then maybe the forms could be dynamically generated to be what you need to enter to solve that particular problem. So I think once we start to see this extension of this stuff, and, and it gets smarter and more developed, which it is doing and will do inevitably. Um, you know, maybe you don't need to build GUIs at all; it will just generate the ones it needs. You know, perhaps a whole gen. You know, perhaps there's a whole load of applications we use. You know, not not some of the things that probably people here work on. Probs, probably some a lot of basic, boring business software that that has to be still built and maintained uh, out there for, for en entering data, extracting data that people have to interact with. Perhaps some of that could just, it's like, you know, they had four GLs, what we call no-code environments. If it's simple enough for a no-code solution, maybe it really is no-code. Maybe just get rid of that altogether and just talk to the machine. Um, there's a great moment in Star Trek, one of the Star Trek films, where 
Scotty comes back from the future um, and uh, so he's tried to, so, so you can use a computer to find out what you need. And he picks up the mouse and says, computer. Because, uh, oh no, he talks to the computer and he said, oh no, you won't understand that. He said, you need the mouse. And so he picks up the mouse and talks into that. He thinks enough of it. Um, but we're getting near to that, I suppose, a little bit nearer. Am I on my final pondering? Is that about the right time? Yeah. yeah. Final ponder? Yeah. Um, I can show people some more code differences later, but it's, it's probably not time to go to it. For the cross-platform thing, it's, I just put this in so that I addressed it a bit. Um, it's, it's, I say I don't see it, I see it more as, if you use the platform like React, um, then it's just going to be a useful tool to help a programmer like any other tool. Like it could be any language you use that it could assist you with. So it can be useful for these things, but it's, you know, it's not really, it's adding that general programming uh, acceleration. Can it accelerate someone's programming capability? Uh, how much? Maybe twice. Can it do it twice? Maybe, I don't know. With a bit of practice, maybe you can get to three times your previous speed of code generation or development. I don't know what it is. Whatever it is. But it can do that to whatever cross-platform tool you already use, theoretically. It can improve that. But also for sort of dual coding, I call it, rather than cross-platform coding. Building on two platforms but sharing more code. Perhaps, you know, if you're a bit more organized, you design things around, well, let's make sure we use a consistent framework, let's set up standards, you know, all of that standard stuff makes it much easier to do this sort of dual working and perhaps share, share more of the code. Or even some of these, uh, there are some of these things around, um, or uh, you know, things like Kotlin multi-platform that attempts to build some shared code that works in both Android and iOS for that specific problem. Perhaps that would work quite well with this as well. So uh, some of the, just some tips on using it that I've, I've learned and got from other people as well. But some of my experience, uh, to get the best results out of it, provide clear and specific requirements. And uh, it's surprising how <coughs> difficult that can be, you know, to really specify something. You know, if you write, do test-driven development, really a lot of it's about that, being very specific about what you, what you want and covering, covering the bases. Providing more context can sometimes trigger it to give you some better results. You can also tell it you made a mistake, point out the errors. I mean, it's quite, it's quite fun when you get some output. The one I had this morning where it said, you know, use this opacity modifier in Android. I simply opened another chat and I said, is there an opacity modifier in Android? And it said, no, there isn't. <laughs> so it sort of contradicts itself in quite sort of a charming way, actually. Um, so, uh, and always ask, ask again and slightly rephrase the question. Because it's just generating output based on probabilistically what it thinks comes next, if you slightly change what you ask it, that probability will change and it might come out with the right answer. So tweaking it like that can make it work much better. Rephrasing or altering the context is sort of a version of those things there. Um, sometimes I like to do what I just described, which is to start a whole new chat and ask it again without the context. I might have put something into my context that's confusing it. So I'll start from scratch. Um, there's something called the system role that people spend a lot of time messing around with. You say to things like, take the role of a senior iOS developer, now solve this. And it, it's actually programmed in to, to work, they discovered actually by accident, um, a bit like the, the hack that allowed these things to become really smart, that um, if you actually put that in, it was better. It came with better results. If you said, Pretend you were a very knowledgeable person, it comes up with better answers. How weird is that? <laughs> and it was so amazing, that amazed, the, that amazed the researchers, nobody expected it. So they actually put that in, they then coded it in as an expectation in the system. So it now is, is programmed to look for what they call the system command or the system, you know, the, the system statement. So you can make a statement like that. My favourite one is I should say, please do not provide explanations. Because one of the other things that's annoying is once you want to generate some code, you don't want to tell you how it works. I just want the code, right? So I can figure out how it works. So ask it not to provide explanation. Shut up, basically. One of the, um, one of the sort of funnier, uh, one, of the, one of the scientists who's keen on pointing out, there's a bunch of scientists who I, I'm very, uh, I like to listen to who are very sceptical about these technologies and some of the hype claims made out of it. And one of these is referred to what it is as a stochastic parrot. So it's like a sort of a probabilistic parrot because really it is sticking out towards you what it's, it's consumed already. 
You know, I have tried to write a piece of code that I found hard to write, that I couldn't find any solutions for on the internet, and it couldn't do it. And what was quite amusing for me is I, I, I interacted with it and I kept giving it clues about how to do it. Um, and I was forbidding it explicitly from doing it in, in certain ways, and it kept doing it again. It kept repeating these forbidden behaviours because it didn't, it didn't have the capacity to find some content that it had context for that could generate the content I wanted. So it isn't magic. It is based on rehashing stuff, but in a really <coughs> smart way. So what a lot of programs have found is that they quite like this because it allows them to raise their activity to a higher level of abstraction. That is, instead of bricklaying, you can do more designing. So it's, it's more rewarding for programming because you're not forever struggling with those little annoying things that just block you. So that's, one, that's, a, that's a sort of rejoinder to the, oh my god, I'm never going to start programming. So near the end now, I'm just going to provide, there is one, I wanted to show you this, it's kind of funny. Um, I've provided a couple of, uh, see if I can get this up. Oh yeah, I was just going to, can you see that? No. Oh, it's invisible. This is a special invisible uh, presentation <laughs> technique that I've been developing. So it doesn't show other screens. Stop interesting. presenting again. Yeah, oh, I did stop presenting. No. Or, yeah. No, because Keynote's really clever, isn't it? And it'll go and it'll I've killed it. Your... It's dead. No, if you start yeah, Keynote, Keynote again, alive. Oh. Yeah, Keynote is really good. It'll go and put that your presentation back on that screen, but oh. because it thinks, oh, that's a bigger screen. So oh, I can't show you this. I want to yeah. show you this. Um, there's a little piece. I've, I've provided a reference to this anyway. You can go and look at it. You can try quitting Keynote. Or you can just drag it across, right? That, that's the other thing. Ah, yeah. uh, drag it into the... Yeah. But we can't see anything on that screen, can we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your, your desktop's there. This is your second screen. Okay. Next to the play button yeah. on the top bar, if you do that, that, uh, uh, that button... The short sighted yeah. yeah. Oh, there we go. Is that it? No. Yeah. 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 This, this is... It might show you the wrong thing. I think this is my diet history. I think we'll leave that. We'll just go back to the presentation. I think that's the best thing to do. I think we do do P and we're back. Yeah. So um, have a look at that if, if, uh, later on. Uh, super, the superhuman programming. Just type that out. <laughs> just oh, wait for it. it. <laughs> I, I'm assuming at some point you'll have access to this slide. So <laughs> that's foolish of me. But if you just write it down quickly. <laughs> Anyway, it's quite, it's quite interesting because it's, um, it, it isn't what I call superhuman programming. You know? I, I think it's highly, uh, highly dodgy what he's saying. Anyway, um, so some sources that I provided. Again, write these down quick. Um, so uh, quite interesting. This, that was actually from this Sparks of AGI, which is a bit controversial um, paper that Microsoft brought out a few weeks ago where they're saying, is, is GPT-4 showing um, early signs of artificial general intelligence? And there's something to it, something interesting in there, more than just being a stochastic power. Um, one of the things that is a little alarming for programmers um, is that GPT-4, the actual language model, is a lot better at generating code than ChatGPT. But we don't have access to GPT-4 because it hasn't got the safety guardrails on it that stop it, you know, potentially giving biased information. So all of this work they've done to put safety systems around it has dumbed it down. I don't know what that says. Kind of interesting. Um, so as a result, there are things that if you try and generate code with ChatGPT, you might generate 50 or 80 or 100, maybe if you're lucky, a few more lines of code, but it, it sometimes chokes and stops. But GPT-4 will generate several hundred lines of code, apparently. So it's a lot more powerful. Uh, it's a lot smarter. And then a couple of uh, interesting interviews. Um, also, chat Stephen Wolfram, uh, he's got a uh, long... Um, I've, I've put these little links on for S to, to short, shorten links. Um, quite an interesting long discussion of how neural networks work. So if anyone's interested in getting a better understanding of how the technology works, that's quite a thorough one. Um, and I found this rather nice paper. This is all just about the, uh, the original neural network model by Pitts and McCulloch from, uh, from 1943, if anyone's interested in looking at that. So, thank you. Yeah.
I don't know if we've got uh, time for questions, so should we take a, like a five minute break and come back for eight o'clock? Um, I guess you'll be around to answer questions yeah, afterwards. Yeah, definitely, so. yeah. Absolutely. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah.